Welcome to this episode of On Finding Peace, brought to you by Life's Journey Life Coaching. Our host, Chris Shea, is a counselor, nationally recognized speaker, and author on topics of guiding us to finding peace in our daily lives. Learn more about Chris Shea by visiting his website, www.lifesjourneyblog.com. Well, welcome everyone to another episode of On Finding Peace. I'm your host, Chris Shea, and this is the podcast where we talk about practical tips that we all can do on a daily basis, which can lead us to finding our inner peace. I know that inner peace is possible. I've been without it. I've found ways to get it. And on this podcast, we talk about ways that we can find it and keep it on a daily basis. All right. Awesome. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of On Finding Peace. And this is the podcast where we talk with people about ways to find our own inner peace and practical tips that we can do on a daily basis. And today I'm a joined again by uh, John Vespasian, and uh, he has been with us on this podcast a number of times now. It's, it's always good to have him, um, but he is a prolific author and continues to publish, and his books are uh, wonderful reads filled with wisdom. So um, I've told him every time you put a book out, I'll put you on the air, and what does he do? He puts out another book. So uh, it's uh, great to have you with us, John. Many thanks, uh, Chris. Uh, thanks for having me on. And uh, his latest book is titled Undisrupted, How Highly Effective People Deal With Disruptions. And uh, so if you could tell us a bit about yourself, and then um, we'll dive into uh, this book. Uh, I can't wait to hear more about it. Yeah, I've been uh, now writing uh, books for uh, 10 years, uh, books about uh, personal development. And they all have a common thread, uh, which is uh, rational, uh, what they call rational living, which is uh, a, a brand of uh, personal development, a uh, focus on, on rational thinking, on logic. And what I do is very simple. I, I go through uh, dozens and dozens of um, uh, biographies and, and, and real events from history, from different centuries, and I try to draw uh, practical wisdom, practical principles that uh, we can apply today in the 21st century. So what I've done in this, in this latest book, uh, the title is Undisrupted, is to go to many, through many biographies of people who have gone uh, through very heavy uh, disruptions in their lives uh, in terms of health, in terms of uh, accidents, uh, in terms of uh, bankruptcy, and try to draw from those stories um, uh, practical principles that we can apply today, uh, even if some of the stories are from the 19th century, some of the stories are from Russia, uh, some of the stories are from the Middle Ages. Uh, I have taken the stories that I think contain uh, practical uh, principles, uh, irrespective of the period. As we will go, we will go through the interview, we'll go through several stories. And you will see that uh, there is a lot to learn uh, from different centuries when people actually, uh, we tend to make all the time the same mistakes because they are ingrained in the human psychology. And it's very useful to try to learn uh, to improve ourselves because when you're facing a, a major disruptions in your life, it's very difficult uh, to stay calm and to make good decisions. And if we learn uh, from stories from different uh, people in the past, uh, what they have done when they've been facing uh, very, very heavy, uh, severe problems, uh, we can find a way ourselves in our own lives. Well, and that's one of the things that really impresses me with your books. And uh, unfortunately, I haven't yet read this one, but it is on my list and I'm getting to it. But I what I really like is that you are taking the wisdom of the ages and helping us not to repeat history and that's something that is very important for me that you know we need to learn from the past because people have done what we're doing before so why should we be repeating 
what they've already learned. Yeah, we, we tend to uh, repeat the same mistakes uh, because irrespective of the culture, and now we live in a, in a 21st century, we live in a period of a very strong national identity. Uh, people want to identify themselves with their national character. But as we will see, um, there is not much difference in human nature, whether you are in the US or Europe, uh, whether you are in the 21st century or the, tw or the 12th century. Uh, we tend to uh, think in patterns, and, and those are very, very uh, easy to identify. Let me just uh, start with a short story. Oh, definitely. Uh, I got the, the idea from the book uh, when I was reading a biography from the 19th century from a very um, important uh, Russian industrialist. His name was Savan Mamontov. He's the Russian equivalent of uh, Andrew Carnegie, who was um, a, a railroad um, uh, and a steel uh, entrepreneur in, in the US. And Mamontov did the, pretty much the same in Russia. Huh? He built uh, railroads, uh, different lines, and he became very wealthy. Within uh, 10 years, uh, he built uh, some railroads in the, um, in the eastern part of Russia. Uh, we are talking about uh, 1810, uh, so beginning of the, of the uh, 19th century. And he became wealthy. He had uh, two houses, one in Moscow, one in the south of Russia. Uh, he had uh, uh, several children. He was very much a high society personality, a celebrity. He was in the newspapers all the time. But what happened is that uh, he made um, uh, a few mistakes because he was faced with some disruptions. And the disruptions are the following. And Mamontov was at the top of his career. He was very self-confident, uh, very wealthy. And he got uh, the idea, as it's very common uh, with entrepreneurs, that he wanted to expand his business. So he thought, OK, I can now uh, manage uh, very successfully uh, rail railways in different uh, areas of, of Russia. Why not uh, become a steel uh, manufacturer? So he started to get the idea he could do anything because he was very successful. And he started um, several um, uh, steel mills copying uh, what was happening in the United States because he thought that uh, he was talented enough to do anything. So he started this uh, steel manufacturing uh, because he wanted to, uh, to make uh, rails for his railways. He wanted to make locomotives. He wanted to control the whole business uh, from beginning to end. And within a couple of years, he started to lose a huge amount of money. Uh, because there is a, a lot of differences between running a railroad, which is basically a service business, um, and actually producing steel. And he didn't have a clue how to do it. He thought he could learn very quickly, but uh, he very, very, um, uh, he made a lot of mistakes and he started to lose a, a huge amount of money. And then he panicked. And this is what happened uh, even to the best uh, industrialist. Alma Montov was a very experienced uh, businessman. He panicked. And instead of, um, of letting his uh, companies, because he separated his uh, railroad companies from his steel companies, instead of letting the companies go bankrupt, he panicked. He started uh, to become uh, very uh, uncomfortable with the situation. And he uh, did a horrible thing, which is to take money from the railroad and to use the money to pay for the losses of the steel manufacturing. And if, if it was his own company, he could do whatever he wanted. But he had shareholders, he had uh, bondholders, and within uh, a few months, they got wind of what he was doing, and they sued him. And eventually, he was, he was prosecuted uh, by fraud, uh, um, uh, charged with fraud. He was um, on, on the newspapers for, because the trial lasted almost one year. And uh, he was not sent to jail because um, uh, he was just trying to save his company. He didn't actually uh, steal any money for himself. But he made some accounting irregularities. And uh, the, the greatest uh, uh, Russian industrialist of the 19th century uh, was bankrupt. He lost everything. They took everything away from him. Uh, they took the houses. His friends uh, didn't talk to him when, he met them, when they met him on the street. He was completely ostracized. And he spent uh, the last uh, 17 years of his life in total, complete misery. He lost everything. And he was... Um, uh, ostracized to a level uh, which is difficult to imagine uh, today in the, in, the in the times of the internet and the social media. Mamontov uh, went from being one of the uh, great celebrities 
uh, on the country and being a total pariah. Nobody would talk to him, uh, nobody would give him a job. Uh, he was living in total uh, misery for, for 14 years. And I found the story super interesting. I said, how is it possible that such an intelligent, um, a sophisticated uh, entrepreneur, how is it possible that he panicked he started to make uh, mistake after mistake, and eventually he came into a situation where he could not recover uh, because then he was on, on trial. Uh, he had a lot of influences with the government, but uh, when he was on trial, he could not do anything, and he lost everything. So I found the story very intriguing, and this gave me the idea for the book, uh, how to avoid uh, these kind of mistakes uh, when you're facing um, uh, very difficult situations. Al Mamontov, he could have, uh, I mean, when you see the whole story in retrospective, he could have taken measures, uh, he could have um, uh, let his companies uh, go bankrupt, he could have done many things, but he made the typical mistakes that human beings uh, make uh, when we face uh, adversity, when we face disruption. So I went uh, to many, through many stories in the book, uh, going one by one, drawing the, the principles, uh, coming up with uh, strategies to deal with disruption. And this is the, the whole purpose of the book, uh, to show uh, people how to adopt uh, measures, uh, how to react uh, appropriately uh, when you're facing these kind of situations. So when we're looking at these situations and trying to learn the lessons from history, given today's day and age, is it possible for us to protect ourselves from disruptions? Yes, it is possible, uh, but it's not uh, self-evident. Uh, because what would you learn uh, when you are, um, uh, for instance, you, are, you imagine that someone wants to uh, improve his life, you, you get all these books about uh, success and personal development and this kind of stuff. And most books uh, on success, uh, they give you very, uh, common sense ideas, you have to work hard, to have goals, etc., etc. And this is very, very um, positive. Uh, the problem is that they don't tell you uh, what to do uh, when you make mistakes and when you have uh, uh, health problems and this kind of stuff because then uh, people become very depressed and demotivated. So you have to think from the very beginning uh, how to protect yourself. And let me just give you some, some ideas from the books. Look. One of the principles that I found uh, systematically uh, in people who go through adversity and they come uh, on the other side and they come very healthy and uh, they don't lose uh, more than is strictly necessary is that uh, they know how to divide the risk. Uh, they know how to spread the risk, they know how to minimize uh, losses because from the very beginning they have uh, a structure their lives uh, their finances, their uh, even their uh, their job responsibilities, they have uh, made um, arrangements uh, to build a structure which is very much diversified, and they don't put um, uh, all eggs in one basket, as they say uh, in the proverb. Uh, they do it systematically, and this is typically the case. Let me just give you some examples. Look, one of the um, uh, one of the stories I, I uh, present in the book uh, is the story of um, of uh, George Stephenson and his uh, his uh, son Robert Stephenson, and they were uh, very famous industrialists in the in the United Kingdom in the 19th century, and they had to deal in their careers with massive competition, massive disruptions, and they develop uh, different ways um, to deal with these uh, disruptions. And one of the principles that uh, they actually created and they implement it very successfully, is the idea of the diversification. And what, for instance, Sir Robert Stephenson, he came up uh, with a way to structure his days uh, that uh, was quite rigid. Actually, uh, Robert Stephenson used to wake up in the morning, he would read uh, for one hour, uh, just to, do, to learn different things, to try to study, to try to reflect, or he would play some music. And then uh, he would structure his days um, in, in segments uh, quite rigidly, uh, where there were meetings or they had uh, when he was traveling, and then he would reserve uh, every week a few hours uh, for emergencies. And when Stephenson faced um, uh, very heavy litigation, because he made a few mistakes in his career, one of the big mistakes 
is that uh, at some point he created uh, one of his companies, instead of creating a, a limited liability company, he created a partnership. He was very inexperienced at the beginning. And when the company went south and he started to lose money, he was uh, liable for the whole um, uh, debts of the company and he didn't realize that. So Stevenson was uh, at, the, at the verge of uh, bankruptcy, but he kept uh, his calm, his serenity uh, during the whole period uh, just because he had a very much uh, structured uh, day and he went through his routines. Uh, when he had to deal with problems, he had these uh, this extra hours uh, planned in his calendar. But even during the very worst uh, crisis in his life, he went through his routines. He, he uh, followed this uh, strategy of uh, segmentation and diversification. And after two years, he managed to, uh, to reach an agreement uh, with the debtors of the company. And eventually, he, uh, they took over uh, the company from him and he started from scratch. And uh, he never uh, went uh, into depression. He never uh, was uh, excessively stressed. And I think this strategy is one of the main principles I, I present in the book, that uh, if you want to be protected in times of adversity, you have to realize that uh, the human mind is very unstable. You have to put a structure in your life. You have to put some kind of uh, timetable, some kind of uh, activities, uh, some kind of, um, of uh, diversification of, uh, of uh, task that allows you to keep moving forward even in periods of great adversity. Right. And I, I think that's something that we really need to learn, you know, from history, because it seems that in our modern times, we try to avoid adversity at all costs instead of, uh, you know, seeing what we can learn from it, seeing how we can work through it. Uh, so I, I think that that's, um, uh, you know, quite important that way. Um, one of the things that I, I find is uh, interesting is that you tend to encourage the reader um, to embrace uh, disruption. Can you, can you explain a, a bit more about why we would embrace disruption? Yes. Um, uh, one of the main problems that uh, everybody is facing in life is that sometimes you're going to get stuck. Uh, you're going to get stuck in your career, in your finances, uh, sometimes in, in relationships. And the only way to get uh, unstuck and to start uh, going to a, to a higher level uh, is going to, to be some kind of disruption. This is inevitable. So what I'm not saying in, the, in my book that uh, you should have a perfectly smooth life because this is, this is completely unrealistic. But uh, I think the, the, the strategy to embrace disruptions when you have no choice, when you have a life you don't like, when you have a job uh, you don't like, when you have uh, uh, insufficient income, uh, you have to do something. You cannot really just uh, go on day after day because the situation will not uh, improve uh, itself. You have to embrace disruption. And I use uh, an example in the book, um, a very famous man, uh, man from the 1960s, which was uh, Albert Schweitzer, who was a, was a theologian and, uh, and uh, he was teaching at the university in uh, Strasbourg in, um, in France. And uh, he realized that uh, he was not happy. Uh, he was a very uh, experienced professor of theology and he would have his, um, his lessons every week in the university. And in the evenings, uh, what uh, Schweitzer, Albert Schweitzer did was to play um, uh, uh, the organ. He played in the church in the cathedral in uh, Strasbourg, and he played uh, Bach. He played music from the uh, 17th century. So he was a very passionate uh, musician. And uh, during the evenings, he was this, uh, this very um, uh, passionate musician. And during the day, he was this uh, very cool uh, intellectual professor. And he felt that uh, his life was incomplete. He didn't like it. So eventually, he thought, uh, OK, what do I want to do? And the only way was to actually to go through major disruption because he realized that uh, if he wanted to live the way he wanted to live, which was very much uh, in a Christian uh, philosophy, uh, he wanted uh, to help uh, poor people. And he decided after a lot of reflection uh, to go to Africa to become a, a doctor, a physician, and to start a hospital in Africa. 
And this, I mean, you can imagine his, his family because this guy was a professor, he had a good income, he had a career, and he told his family, his parents, that uh, he was going to give up everything and he was going to go through major disruption because he wasn't happy and he wanted to do something else. So he quit his job at university after a, a, a spending uh, uh, 15 years uh, to get a PhD. He quit his job, he enrolled in university to become a, a physician. Uh, eventually he married uh, a, a woman who wanted to go with him to Africa and they went to Africa. They went to Africa, actually to West Africa, to uh, Gabon. And they started uh, a small hospital there. And after some years, uh, uh, Schweitzer became very famous. And, and, uh, but um, what he did, which is actually exceptional, uh, to reduce the risk uh, is something that uh, I don't think that many people know the story, but I found it uh, amazing because you can imagine that this guy goes to Africa. He had uh, no backup because uh, he has uh, lost his job. He cannot go back to the university. And he goes to Africa and, and um, with his wife, and he had, uh, of course, a clear idea that uh, it might be a mistake because he didn't know what he was going to expect uh, there. He didn't know what he's going to survive. He didn't know uh, how was he going to fund his hospital because he didn't have a lot of money. Uh, he did something amazing, uh, which is to realize that uh, the only way for him uh, to make 100% sure that he was going to go through the disruptions. And I'm, we are talking about very, very, very uh, severe disruptions. I mean, to quit your job, to go to Africa, uh, to study uh, another a profession, to become a, a physician from scratch when the guy was already 35. I mean, this is, this is really uh, a major change. And there are very few people who go through such uh, uh, changes. But uh, Schweitzer was very clever and uh, he thought, okay, what happens if everything fails? What happens if I go to Africa and I don't like it? What happens if, uh, if uh, I realize that the whole thing is, is uh, stupid? And he did something very clever, which is uh, to keep always his skills as a uh, as musician, uh, always at the top level, because he knew that uh, if the African uh, project uh, failed, he could always go back to Europe and make a living as a musician because he was a very, uh, very um, skilled uh, organ uh, performer. So when he went to Africa, uh, he took uh, medicines, he took uh, uh, clothes, he took uh, vaccines, and he took uh, a second hand uh, piano, uh, which is something, uh, I mean, you cannot imagine uh, someone going to Africa and taking a piano, but he took a piano with him, a very cheap uh, upright uh, piano, and uh, he started his hospital in Africa uh, with very uh, primitive uh, conditions and he would play every day of the year, every day of the year he would play a uh, piano for one hour just to keep uh, his fingers uh, in good condition, his, uh, his uh, skills in good condition because he knew that if he ever needed money he could go back to Europe and make money as a musician and when he was in Africa several times he ran out of money and he went back to Europe and he spent uh, six months uh, giving concerts in different cathedrals uh, and making good money. And he would use the money uh, to fund uh, his, um, his hospital in Africa. So the, the lesson from the story is fantastic because you see people going uh, through major, major disruptions, but they kept uh, always uh, a safety um, uh, procedure. Uh, they kept always uh, a backup solution that uh, allowed uh, 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 Schweitzer to go through the whole situation in a very calm uh, spirit. He didn't got stress when he got to Africa. He didn't get stress when he got to Africa. Uh, he didn't despair uh, when he ran out of money because he knew that he always he could always rely on his skills as a musician. And this is a great um, practical lesson. Right? When you go through disruptions. Uh, don't destroy your skills. If you know how to do something and you have spent uh, many years to develop your skills, even if you cannot uh, exploit uh, the skills uh, temporarily, keep them at a good level. Keep training, uh, keep uh, performing like Schweitzer did when he was in Africa, because sooner or later, if you go through a problem, you can always rely on your skills uh, to recover. That's an awesome lesson. I, I really appreciate you sharing that story. And uh, 
I, I just can't imagine back in those days traveling with a piano. I don't care if it's an upright or not. <laughs> I just can't imagine. Um, so in, in that story in, in particular, uh, to me, that really shows a way of thinking in, in very positive ways. So when we look at today's day and age, do you feel that positive thinking can help us to deal effectively with, you know, um, either disasters, disruptions, adversities, whatever might be happening in today's world? Uh, positive thinking can help uh, if you do it in the right way. Uh, let me explain this because it's, uh, I, I think that the idea of positive thinking today is very much abuser huh? because, I mean, people think it's like, I don't know, magic and you just uh, believe something and it will happen. Uh, it is not like this. It is not the way uh, that uh, positive thinking was invented. And I went in the in the book. I went through the um, through the story of how actually positive thinking was invented, because it's an idea from the from the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century. And it was invented in a way that worked. And let me just tell you the story very quickly, because um, I would think it will open uh, the eyes of many people to understand actually what positive thinking was supposed to mean and, and, and why it works in some situations and why it doesn't work in, some situ in other situations. Uh, the person who uh, actually invented uh, the whole story of positive thinking uh, was a Frenchman, was a pharmacist. Uh, his name was Emile Coué and he, uh, he died in 1926. And Coué, um, uh, uh, he studied pharmacy. He was uh, uh, from a very poor family, but uh, he managed to go to university, he studied uh, pharmacy, and uh, he, he then he uh, went through an apprenticeship for two years, and then he started uh, a pharmacy in a small village uh, in the north of France, in Troyes, a small village, it's about uh, 100,000 people. Uh, and then uh, Kue, uh, he was selling basically uh, uh, prescriptions from doctors, he was selling uh, herbal uh, preparations, this is what actually people bought in the 19th century. Uh, he was um, uh, he was doing well. He was not super successful, but he was just making a living in his pharmacy. But he was a very curious man, and this is something that uh, set him apart, I think, from other pharmacists uh, in the 19th century. He was uh, reading newspapers every day. He always wanted to learn, and then he saw an advertisement in a newspaper uh, from someone in another city called uh, Nancy, which is a bit bigger, uh, also in the north of France offering uh, training courses on uh, hypnotism. Uh, he was something, uh, it was something completely new in the 19th century and uh, Kue saw the advertisement and the course, uh, I mean, he had to travel to Nancy and this was, uh, I mean, the 19th century, it was not so easy to travel. I mean, to travel a couple of hundred kilometers can, can easily take a day. So in the end, uh, he was hesitating, but in the end, okay, he closed his pharmacy for a couple of weeks uh, he saved some money and he went uh, to Nancy to take this course about uh, hypnotism. He spent uh, some, some time and some money and he took the course from, uh, from a guy called uh, Hippolyte and then returned to the pharmacy. And he was very impressed with the course. Um, and he thought, how can I use this in my pharmacy? So uh, he developed uh, for the first time in history the idea of positive thinking. I mean, Kue uh, thought, okay, I cannot hypnotize people uh, in the pharmacy, obviously, because it will not work, but maybe I can use uh, some type of indirect uh, suggestion uh, to make people positive about uh, their recovery. And what Kue did, uh, very, very clever, because he wasn't a scientist, huh? you have to realize that he was not uh, one of these uh, gurus uh, without any scientific uh, background. Kue was a, a pharmacist. He had studied science in university. So he realized that he wanted to have some kind of scientific experiment uh, to see if this positive thinking uh, could work or not. So what he did systematically uh, when people went to his pharmacy to ask for a prescription, say, oh, I have a headache, uh, what do I take? I have a pain in my back, what do I take? So Kue uh, would give them uh, his herbal uh, preparations uh, based on, on uh, I don't know, chamomile or sage or whatever he was using as a preparation. But then he would tell them, this is exactly what you need, it's going to help you, and in a few days you will be well. So he would paint in their minds a picture of recovery. 
a picture of very fast and complete recovery. And he would talk to them instead of just selling uh, his stuff. He would talk to them for 10 minutes. He will explain to them how it worked, how is what they are going to um, to improve uh, very quickly. And he realized that uh, people started to improve faster because uh, it's not just that uh, it was just like magic that people believe uh, uh, that they want to recover and they recover. No, no, no. What Kue realized is that uh, when he told people that uh, they were going to recover and they're going to get through their, through their problems, through their disruptions, uh, what he actually uh, engaged is that people took uh, their medication uh, very seriously because he told them, look, if you take this preparation every day in the morning and in the evening, and then you go to sleep and then uh, don't forget and, ta, ta, ta. and then he told the story and people uh, took it very seriously because he painted the picture of recovery uh, that was very vivid, very colorful. And Kue was practicing uh, these uh, techniques, which is a very uh, primitive uh, way of positive thinking because he invented the whole story himself and he realized that uh, it really worked. He made the statistics uh, and within a few years, he became extremely wealthy because people would go uh, to his pharmacy, even from 100 kilometers away, because they, they heard that uh, this guy, this Emil Kue, was able to give you prescriptions that always worked. So in the end, he invented a uh, positive thing. He became very wealthy. He retired very early. And he spent uh, the last uh, 15 years of his life uh, giving free advice to people about uh, positive thinking. But again, I come to the, to the principle, positive thinking is very useful if you put it together with the right type of action. And this is something that uh, nowadays in the 21st century people have forgotten. Positive thinking is not uh, believing nonsense. Positive thinking is about reinforcing uh, the right type of action. And uh, Kue invented the principle in the, 20th, in the 19th century. It still works today but you have to put uh, thinking and action together and and that's exactly the philosophy that you know I, I try to promote with everybody uh, today is you know it, it's takes action we don't sit back and wait for something positive to happen or or for anything to happen you know for that matter if, if we want to see change then we need to take action and make that change happen so I, I, I appreciate you sharing that one because, you know, it, it's just so important and so many people miss that. Um, so where can people find your book so that uh, they can learn from the wisdom of the ages? Uh, it, it, it's very simple to find my books or to find uh, my stuff. If you just type on Google, uh, John Vespasian, you will find the books there in Amazon, they are in the um, uh, Apple Store. Uh, they can be ordered uh, from different uh, uh, means. It's very easy. Just type John Vespasian on Google, you will find everything in one second. You will find also my blog. There is, uh, there is also a free newsletter. Uh, John Vespasian, very, very easy to find. Awesome. Um, and I will, on the show notes, put a, a link to uh, um, your Amazon books. And I encourage people to take a look at all of your books. Uh, you know, again, it's, you know, on just various topics, but learning from the wisdom of, of the past. And uh, that's very important for us to do so that, you know, we can live in our present time with the knowledge and the experience of, of those who've uh, gone before us. And, you know, that that's very important. So, Again, the latest work from uh, John Vespasian is Undisrupted, How Highly Effective People Deal with Disruptions. And uh, once again, John, I really appreciate your time to come and be with us. And as I have said multiple times prior, when your next book comes out, I, I hope to hear from you. Many thanks, uh, Chris. I wish you a great weekend. Uh, we'll talk to you soon. All right. Great. Thank you for listening to this podcast episode, and I hope that the message in this episode has inspired you and given you some of the tools that you need to find peace in your life. 
if you have found those tools and you found this to be inspiring and you know of others who also need these tools, please share this podcast with them. Let them know of the opportunities out there that they too can find their inner peace. Thank you very much for the sharing. Thank you for listening and have a very mindful day. Thank you for listening to this episode with Chris Shea. Learn more about Chris Shea by visiting his website, www.lifesjourneyblog.com.